Okay, it looks like it's top, the top of the hour. Good to see all of you here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come together on this Wednesday night, study the Bible together. About halfway through the last month of the year, just a couple of weeks left, I guess about a, what, a week and a half left in the year. And uh, so we're, it's exciting times for everyone, uh, no doubt. Uh, the holidays and busy, and a lot going on. And uh, we certainly want everyone to be safe uh, over the next week or week and a half. And uh, all that you're doing, if you have any traveling or people traveling to you. And, um, but of course, we will meet together again on Sunday, Lord willing, the 24th, the day before Christmas. <clears throat> we are beginning Ecclesiastes chapter 1 tonight. There are new handouts on the tables if you would like. To get one, you're welcome to do so. Everything is on the screen, so it's just your preference. If you want one to use to follow along or to take home and study or to take notes, uh, but they are out there if you would like to, uh, to get one. Before we get into Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, uh, we'll have our prayer, a couple of prayer requests. We want to continue to remember uh, Tommy McCorkle in our prayers. Um, Ann said he's going tomorrow for another consultation, so we want to keep him in our prayers. And then also Lynn Melson, she said to tell everyone hello and uh, keep praying for her. She's uh, been battling and still battling some health issues, and uh, we want to uh, keep uh, Lynn in our prayers. And she certainly, certainly sends her, her greetings and, uh, to, to all, of, all of you. Are there other prayer requests that we have? Uh, this evening okay all right if you were not here mm -hmm. absolutely certainly remember the people in ukraine if you were not here sunday uh, kathy turner's sister rosalind was uh, got a good report and we were happy for that and kathy was back with us sunday and uh still surgery but they're thankful that they can do surgery is my understanding and so um we're happy for that. Okay. Jeff got a good report. Good, good. You may, may or may not have known that uh, Je Jeff was having some test run, and we're, we're thankful, thankful for that, absolutely. The loss, certainly will. Thank you, Charles. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day, and the beauty of it and the blessings that we enjoy. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to assemble together this evening to study the Bible. We're grateful for all of our classes and our teachers. We're thankful for each family who meets here and assembles here uh, to worship you, to study, to praise you, to draw near, to draw closer to one another and closer to you. We pray that all that we do will, will glorify you according to your word as we uh, seek to, uh, to come together in times like this, uh, to encourage one another and as we depart, to be stronger and faithful in all that we do in our homes and places of work and uh, business in and around the community. Help us to do all things well-pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray for Tommy. We pray that all will go well with this consultation tomorrow and his body will be strong for whatever decisions are made. We ask your blessings to be upon him and his health at this time. Pray for uh, Lynn and her health at this time, we pray that uh, uh, she'll be able to find uh, uh, proper treatment uh, and uh, we know she desires to be back here with us and be active in Bible study and worship and in the community. We ask your blessings to, to be with her. Father, we thank you for uh, Jeff Donnan's good news and we're grateful uh, for, for that and we ask your blessings to be, be with him now. We're thankful for the, the good work that he does uh, here faithfully and so much uh, volunteer work around the building and we're thankful for his efforts. Father, we continue to pray for those in uh, nations like uh, Ukraine and Israel and Afghanistan and Burma, uh, especially these areas and even here in the United States, many areas where uh, there's much bad tragedy that's going on and uh, we pray that there could be uh, peaceful solutions uh, to all uh, all of that, all the hurt, and crime, and wars that we're seeing right now. Bless us as we study and help us to learn from this very book, uh, not to repeat the mistakes of so many, 
uh, but to always glorify you and put you first. Thank you so much for Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Help us walk closely in the steps of the Savior each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so over the last two weeks, we, um, we've looked at the introduction for Ecclesiastes. And uh, today we're ready to begin into in Ecclesi- Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Before, I'm, I'm going to read the chapter because they're short chapters. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is only 12 chapters long. They're short chapters and they're short verses. So 18 verses. New King James text is what I'm using. Again, there are handouts on the tables. If you would like to get a handout, you're welcome to do so. Um, you're, you're certainly welcome to get one at this time if you would like to do so. But before I read the chapter, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I have a um, New King James reference Bible. And so it gives a little introduction to each book. And as I was reading the intro, uh, I thought they uh, made some interesting comments. And I wanted to... Uh, to read just a, uh, a paragraph from the introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes uh, from the uh, New King James. I think this is Nelson. I don't know. I had it rebound years ago, so I'm not sure who, uh, who published this one. But uh, I'm going to read this and then read the chapter, and then we'll get into some thoughts on Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The key word in Ecclesiastes is vanity. The emptiness of trying to be happy apart from God. The preacher, traditionally taken to be Solomon, the wisest, richest, most influential king in Israel's history, looks at life under the sun, and from the human perspective, declares it all to be empty. Power, popularity, prestige, pleasure, nothing can fill the God-shaped void in man's life but God himself. But once seen from God's perspective, perspective, life takes on meaning and purpose, causing Solomon to exclaim, Eat, drink, rejoice, do good, live joyfully, fear God, keep his commandments. Skepticism and despair melt away when life is viewed as a daily gift from God. I thought that was a little interesting, the introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's read the chapter. I want to read the chapter with you again. It's a short chapter, um, short verses, so only 18 verses. Let's read the chapter and then we'll make comments as we work our way through Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full, to the place from which the rivers come. There they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done. Is there is nothing new under the sun? Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I set my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. And I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So that's Ecclesiastes chapter 1 in the first, uh, or all 18 verses. Let's notice a little bit in the first seven verses. uh, Vanity of vanities, the the world remains. That's what we're going to notice uh, in these first seven verses. You know, when we look at this book, and as we've noticed in our introduction over the last couple of weeks, what can give life meaning? 
and satisfaction and fullness. That's usually what people question quite often, isn't it? What is the meaning of life? What, how can I be happy? How can I, how can I be satisfied uh, in, in life? Well, Solomon is about to tell us what cannot bring happiness, fullness, and meaning. Until you get to chapter 12, of course. You know, fear God and keep his commandments. Solomon is going to tell of all of this that, um, that is without. Notice again verses 1 and 2. The preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Life without God is empty, and that's something we'll see over and over in this book. King Solomon tried life, all that life had to offer, and he found out that it is useless. Now he wants you to listen to the preacher Solomon and see the value in life. Think about that. You have, you have this man who was the king, who was uh, the king of Israel probably in, in their glory days. David left them with relative peace after Solomon the split. Uh, downhill from there, uh, a wealthy nation, as the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, uh, would proclaim. So you have this king throughout the book saying, look at everything I've done. Look at everything that I have tried. Whether I've examined it from other people or I've tried it myself. But instead now, chapter 1 and verse 1, as well as chapter 1 and verse 12, the words of the preacher now he wants you to listen to the preacher Solomon to see the true value in life. Notice verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Five times in that one verse. Emptiness, of empty, says the preacher. Empty of emptiness. All is empty. I mean, it, this, this is what he's, this is his introduction to this book, to this, to this sermon, perhaps, whatever the case may have been. And this is, here is this man, now he's going to sit out throughout this chapter and throughout this book to help us to realize how much of life, well, everything in life is worthless, is empty, if God is not in it, if God is not a part of it, if God is not first. Notice in verse 3, man's labor. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Think about what he is saying at the beginning of verse 3. If you want to, you can leave your ribbon marker there. You can see we have another number of places that we're going to turn to tonight. When I read verse 3, I think of Luke chapter 9 and verse 25. What profit has a man from all his labor? Man's labor, Luke chapter 9 and verse 25. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Here is Jesus in Luke chapter 9 and verse 25 saying, What does it matter? What, is it, what does it matter if you gain the entire world? Just, I mean, if you could look around at what we have right here in this area and say, it, everything here belonged to me. Everything in Florence, Alabama belonged to me. That would be saying something, wouldn't it? But Jesus said, the whole world, if you could gain it all, if you had everything, if it was all yours. When you lose your soul, it really means nothing. You think of man's labor in verse 3. What profit has a man from all his Labor. Now, this book, of course, is not contradiction, contradicting other places in the Bible where we are to work, we're to be active, we're to be busy, we're to do good with what the Lord has given us. This is true. This is certain. We must realize that and understand that. But we see, if you continue on, in verse 3, he says, What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Something we're going to see a number of times talking about being under the sun. Basing his conclusions on sight rather than faith. And a lot of people live life like that. I think even a lot of Christians live life like that. You know, what, what can I see? What is, what is, what is before me? What, what can I touch? What can I, what can I feel? What can I hear? What can I smell? 
He talks about, in verse 3, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Notice in the book of 2 Corinthians. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Yes. Sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, great point, excellent point. Going back to number one, uh, with life without God is empty. The opposite of that, of course, life with God is full. And uh, certainly that is true. And that's what you see uh, this book leading up to, especially when you get down to the last two chapters, in particular chapter 12. And, and, you know, and if you do everything in life uh, without God, then it, it's all meaningless. It's all vanity. It's all empty. But certainly, if you do it with God and be productive in doing it with God and doing it for God, uh, and that's, that's the point of it. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of... Well, it's, it, it, some people believe that this is a sermon. He calls himself a preacher twice, you know, in this, this first uh, chapter. So, yeah, if you, if you listen to the entire sermon, but then you walk out before the conclusion in chapter 12, you've missed a point. <laughs> you, you've, you've missed it all. And uh, he even says, you know, this is the conclusion of the matter. So absolutely, um, that's, that's interesting when you, when you see that life without God is empty, but life with God is, is full, regardless of how little or much you might have, uh, your labor or whatever it might be. Great, great point. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, so if you notice in point number four, number, I think mine is the same as yours, yeah, labor, I made some changes. It's number three. It's number three on the screen. I made some changes to my notes. So man's labor, then you're under the sun. Under the sun. Point number three. You see where he's setting the stage here, number three, in which he toils under the sun. And, and what you're going to notice moving forward is, is Solomon is, is going to describe the earth, the continual rotation of the earth, it's words, and he's going to describe mankind and generations coming and generations going. He's going to get into chapter 2 and all of these areas that he tried. But notice when you focus on, I saw everything under the sun. We as Christians, of course, are to be directed by faith. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 7 I have a couple of verses up there for you to notice. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now obviously we look around us and we see the evidence for God and we're going to get into that in this chapter. But as we're going to see also with the Hebrews writer in a moment, first of all we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. Um we must be reminded that we're walking through what we see in the Bible. So the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And, and when you think about sections of scripture that would teach us to be completely different than everything that you see going on in the world. For example, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. It's, we're, we're guided by a completely different, the right way, the only good way, God's way. Uh, but so many people choose not that way. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But in this book, as he's setting the stage back in verse 3, he's going to talk about everything that he's seen under the sun, everything that he's 
noticed, everything that he's recognized. Look also to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. As you know, the Hebrews writer, which this too may be a sermon. I think that's interesting. It's possible that the book of Hebrews was a sermon preached or a series of sermons. And it's possible that the book of Ecclesiastes was a sermon that was preached. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrews writer is going to list a bunch of men and women and their faithfulness to God. And he says, beginning in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now we were not there when it happened, of course, but our faith believes it. The word of God confirms it, of course. Uh, and, and And the word of God is where we get our faith to know how all of this came to be. And then you drop down to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you go back to our text in Ecclesiastes, you know, again, Solomon is here. He's talking about vanity of vanities, what profit is labor if, again, you do it without God, as he's doing it without God throughout this book until you get to the last chapter, in which he toils under the sun. And so that's kind of setting the stage for where we're going uh, in this book. Any thoughts or comments, questions? Okay, notice verse 4. One generation passes away and another generation comes if you think about how you know life ends labor ends is he's going to talk about that uh, he talked about that uh, what profit has a man from all of his labor he's going to get into that in chapter two as well but he talks about generations coming and generations going but the earth it abides forever here again you have your sight versus your faith And you think about where would life be without the hope of eternity? What would there be? Without the hope of eternity, without the hope of being with God. You think of all the generations who have passed away and all who, uh, until the Lord returns, all who will pass away. Meaningless without eternity. Notice in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you go over just a couple of chapters to chapter 7 in verse 1. Chapter 7 and verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. So we're going to get into that, of course, when we get into chapter 7. But here we have, going back to our text, one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. That's challenging when you step away from God, you step away from the the Word of God, you step away from the Bible. It can be certainly challenging to answer some questions, could it not? When you see some passing and you see the earth continuing to rotate, you see the earth continuing to move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, we'll talk about how there's victory in death. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, Paul claimed, I, I, would, I would rather die. I would rather die and go and be with God. It's more needful for me to be here with you. You see in the Revelation letter a couple of times, be faithful unto death, you'll receive the crown of righteousness. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. As well as chapter 14 and verse 13 in the book of Revelation. You see this where they will rest from their labors. So you're setting the stage, you're continuing to set the stage where these generations pass away. There's so much that Solomon cannot explain from his trials, from his testing, 
from his experiences. But we're reminded that in God, everything's okay. Because it's not about life that's here. It's about life that uh, is eternal, of course. In verses 5 through 7, he's going to use nature. He says, the sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea and yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. I mean, you think about here again, here again, you, you, you start the book out, vanity of vanities. It's, it's empty. Everything's empty. Everything is meaningless. And so here he is, he's trying to, he's trying to look at, at everything that he, that he is seeing and, and you, you can't explain it without God. It cannot be explained without God. Although many would attempt to do so, many would try to do so, Many would look for ways to claim that they have explained it. But yet they can't. Open your Bible to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. This is a psalm that you know very well. <clears throat> psalm chapter 19 verse 1 beginning. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day into day other speech, and night into night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of her chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So you see in this chapter, Psalm 19, and you relate that to what the preacher, the king, Solomon, is saying back in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. In these first seven verses, here is there's, there's evidence that is there that we see that is all around us. But again, if we're looking to explain it, if we're trying to explain it without a God, we keep coming up empty. We keep coming up short. We keep coming up without answers. Here's a thought that I had on verses 5 through 7. Think about how many people throughout the history of time have lived life in Maybe a miserable state. Maybe a miserable state because they're looking at everything under the sun. They're not looking for God. They're not looking to, to, to try to understand God. They're trying to explain everything with just what they can see rather than faith, rather than the Bible. Or maybe they've come to believe what so many have been told, that this all happened by chance and it's all here by chance. When you reduce life, to from the monkey to the grave. This is how we got here. And this is where we're going. This is where it's ending. There's nothing after it. There's not really many reasons to be happy, is there? There's not much to be happy about when you think about if this is it. If this is all, this is where it came from and this is where it's going. And I think that completes the thought of verses 4 through 7. One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth is continuing on. Well, what is it? What, what, what else could there be? What, what more is there? Chapter 12 answers it for us. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because life, we're just so, we're pilgrims, we're sojourners going through this life, going through this period of time, day in and day out, until it's over. Any thoughts or comments or questions on the first seven verses? Mm -hmm.
water cycle. Mm -hmm. Not the thing. And in the church, you know, we've been associated with Wood Avenue for 40 years. And we have seen people come and people go and baby born and both grown up and making their own babies. We've seen the, the flow. And it would be so, I don't know, it would just seem so sad if we were just on repeat without purpose, mm -hmm. without, if we don't teach our young people so that they can be the next generation that teaches God and shows Christ. All that, it just, it has to do with living for God is what gives it purpose, or sure. else it is just on the Sure. That was a great point. I don't know if you heard it or not. Um, uh, let me mention that first. Repeat without a purpose. That, that's, a, that's really a great way to sum up this first chapter. On repeat without a purpose. Things continue. One day turns into the next and the next and so forth and so on. So it's just day after day, uh, the sun, the water, the rivers, the ocean. But there's no, there's no purpose in it. That's a great point. And Kathy was relating it to church, of course. You see the continual cycle in church over the years. And some of you have been here for many years. And you've seen that. Or maybe you've seen that in other congregations where you've come from. Uh, and you could, you could say the same about your family, of course. There is that where the next generation is born, and, and, and you're teaching it to be productive, teaching it to be faithful, teaching the next generation to, to do their part. And you see that it is. It's a, continual, it's a continual turnover. And what we're experiencing today, as we're nearing the end of 2023, you know, God put into motion and he put into place that creation week back in Genesis chapter 1. And what a joy it is to... To still be a part of that. But we as Christians, again, going back to some of the verses we mentioned earlier in 2 Corinthians 5 and Hebrews chapter 11, you know, well, we look at everything going on around us in a, in, a, in a different way than everybody else. We look at it as the, the work of God, the handiwork of God, and that God is giving it to us for a period of time to enjoy. But we know that life is not limited to what we have here. And we're thankful that it's not. We enjoy life here. You do, I guess. I do. And hope to have many more years here. But that's one of the things that Solomon is going to talk about in this book is that's not what's most important. What's most important, of course, is there again, everything leads into that final chapter. Fearing God. Remember God in the days of your youth. Chapter 12 and verse 1. Fearing Him, keeping His commandments. As chapter 12 comes to an end. In verses 13 and 14, I think it is. So, um, certainly, this is, this is true. You know, and one of the things, I mentioned this as well. I always enjoy being around Christians. For example, verses 5 through 7, and Solomon is giving us a picture into nature. I always enjoy being around Christians when you maybe see a sunset. We don't have one of the most beautiful sunsets in all of Alabama, out on the river if you're down at McFarland. I mean, it's just a beautiful sunset. If you've not taken advantage of that, you need... It's too late tonight, but you need to go tomorrow night and see that sunset. Or, or whatever it might be, the mountains or the, whatever it is that you enjoy. And I always enjoy experiencing times like this with Christians because almost always the Christian, instead of talking about the sun, talks about God behind the sun. The creator of the sun. The creator of the mountains. The creator of the water. The creator of the ocean. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful when that is your immediate thought. And there again, that's something we'll see in this book, and we're seeing in these first few verses, that this one, in observing life without God, even testing life, even experiencing life, we're going to especially get into that in chapter 2, when he gets into some of the things that he has tried. He says, without God, it means nothing. Any, any other thoughts or, or, or comments on the first, first seven verses? Okay, if you move along uh, into verses 8 through 11, verses 8 through 11, vanity of vanities. Uh, the first one we were discussing, that of the world remains. But now we're talking about unsatisfied man. 
Notice in verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. All the goods of the world are not enough to fulfill man's desire. And you know, by the time we end this study, however many weeks away it will be, it's probably you might be tired of hearing that over and over. But but that is that is the point of the book through the first ten and a half or eleven chapters is that there's not enough in life to to give you what what you're looking for to to purchase happiness to buy happiness or anything like that again back in verse 3 what profit has a man from all his labor verse 8 all things are full of labor man cannot express it the eye cannot uh, the eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing there's there's just not there's not there's always something more no when when we're not content remember this is not in your notes but um was it Philippians? Philippians chapter 4, I think. Paul, a prisoner, writing to the church at Philippi, said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, now that, I, now that I speak in regard in need, or excuse me, now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Here is a man who was walking by faith rather than sight. Here was a man who in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 28, had, had went through everything when it comes to beatings and persecutions and uh, the, 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 um, the scourging and all that he went through. But yet, as a prisoner, he's, I'm content. I'm content, you know, whatever it is. He didn't want that life. I'm sure nobody just wants to wake up and go to prison later that day and be beaten or anything like that. But his focus was on God. And so he didn't have to have everything that Solomon tried. He didn't, he didn't have to have all of that. You know? And, and that's, that's one of your main differences in someone like Solomon and someone like Paul. Paul was fully focused on heaven. He was focused on his treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, Solomon was focused on his treasure on earth. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and elsewhere, it's not wrong to have it. Solomon misused it. Solomon got his priorities out of order. And that's one of your issues. You notice verses 9 through 11, just as the earth continues with its cycles, there's the continual cycle of mankind to seek the same emptiness generation after generation. He said, that which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after Think a couple of thoughts from verses 9 and 10 when he says there's nothing new under the sun. Can you say there's anything new? You know, Solomon lived about 3,000 years ago. And yet here he is saying there's nothing new. Nothing, nothing new. You know. and, and again, it goes back to verses 5 through 7. There's nothing new about the sun rising, the sun going down, the waters running from the rivers into the oceans, the wind blowing. Mankind, verses 8 through 11, is the same. We might have new toys. We might have new gadgets. But there's nothing new. They did not have airplanes then. But an airplane is just a new way of travel. They still traveled. They did not have phone or internet, but they still had ways of communication. See, it's just, it's just new gadgets. It's just, it's just new, new ways, maybe, to fulfill what they were doing in different ways. You think of even common day warfare. They didn't have what we have and, uh, and, and the, the guns and ammunition and the missiles and the bombs. But they had wars. They had battles. 
they had, as we're studying on Sunday morning, Solomon and his spears. Man, that guy, he must have been a kind of a, either, either the providence of God was protected David and Jonathan, or, or he just was not a good shot. So at least three times he missed them with the spear. Think about that between now and Sunday morning. They had spears, we have missiles. But the end result is the same. People are the same. People are the same. That's, that's, that's what Solomon is getting at here in verses uh, 8 through 11. You know, at the base of it all, the previous nations, the, the previous uh, people, the previous generations, they saw the sun rise, they saw it go down, they, they saw the, the, the wind blowing, they felt the wind blowing, they, the, the rivers running into the seas. You know, we're seeing it today. Generation from now, they'll see it when we're no longer here, whenever that time shall be that we're no longer here. But here's Solomon again in these verses, verses 8 through 11. You know, you, you, you can't be satisfied if it's all about what's under the sun, if it's about what's here in this life rather than eternity in God. And, and oh, by the way, there's nothing different. There's not, nothing different, nothing, nothing that, that, that hasn't been. What people are looking for today is what people looked for then. And it's, it's all the same. In verse 11, there's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come. You know, so you think about that. Yeah, some people, their names have stood the test of time. Primarily some of these people that we read about in the Bible, but very few have. How far can you go back in your own family history and name names? What, what's important is not that we are remembered by the people that we're around, but that we're remembered by God. You know, the world will not remember us. I've given a reference in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8. That verse has always stood out to me in that there was a new king or a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. You remember the Pharaoh... When Joseph, at the end of the book of Genesis, saved all of his people and brought them into uh, Egypt. But it, that generation passes, a new generation is now there. And here's a new king that did not know Joseph or the kindness that they had with these people. A man like Joseph. But we're not worried about him anymore. I want to do things, I want to do things my way. So it's not about doing something great for people to remember other than helping people to go to heaven. It's about God remembering me who can count even the hairs on my head. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. So you see Solomon's kind of setting the stage here. He's building it. He's using earth. He's using the world. It's continuing to remain. But then he's using man in history, verses 8 through 11. You know, if, if, we're, if we're only focused on what we can see, if we're only focused on the here and now, then we'll never be satisfied. Thoughts, comments? We don't have time to get into the next section, so there's two or three minutes left. If, yes, go ahead. Uh, you were just making me think of Philemon, Onesimus. Yes. Onesimus' you know, name meant useful, profitable. Before he wasn't focused on God. As soon as he became focused on God, then he was described as being profitable. Sure. And so if we want to have a useful, profitable life, we have to be useful for God. That's a great point. From the book of Philemon in the New Testament, the name of uh, Onesimus um, means useful or profitable, profitable. And, and that's how Paul sends him back. You know, that's an interesting book and study when here's this, this runaway slave. And I can only imagine what he thought Paul would say to him. I, this is just me thinking, my opinion. I don't think that probably he thought Paul was going to send him back. But he does. And he sends him back with this letter. He's, he's useful to you. He is profitable. And receive him as your brother. Because it's, not, and it's no longer about that, that earthly relationship that Philemon and Onesimus had. It's, it's about the godly relationship that they now have and what they can do together in God. So, yeah, that's, that's a, certainly a, 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 great, uh, a great point. In anything else? Yes? Mm -hmm. Just a couple of remarks. I know we've got a long way to go to the Ecclesiastes, but there's several places throughout the Scriptures, John 10. Talks about how the, the God uh, gives us, uh, you know, life uh, uh, and, and more abundantly. Mm -hmm. And so He 
he's, he's given us his life with joy. And, uh, you know, as we, as we live it for him. Sure. The things he provides for us in his life for the first in joy. Sure. Great, great point, great one to end on. John chapter 10 and verse 10, God gives us life and gives it more abundantly to us. And, and that's what it said. And you know that. That's why you're here at 7 o'clock on a cold Wednesday night in December. Um, but we can't lose our focus. That's the problem. Remember, we'll, we'll say that as we close. That was a problem with Solomon and people like Solomon. They lost their focus. At one point in time, it was about God. He was the one who prayed for wisdom. Help me to know how to rule this nation. But at some point, he loses his focus, and it's no longer about God. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Um, we will finish chapter 1 next week and get into chapter 2. And uh, I hope that you're enjoying this study. I'm excited about it, and we'll have our break now.